The webinar is now broadcasting to all attendees. <laughs> all, none of them. Oh, 13. We got some. 14. Ha ha! Welcome, people. Aloha. 18 now. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Just growing. 19. Somebody's even chatting already. Uh oh. So you've come to the right place. We're going to be officially <laughs> starting in 10 minutes. Yeah. Yep, you are indeed here. So I guess we should, uh, you know, chat amongst ourselves, uh, sort of the same sort of uh, networking conversation or, or other things that okay, one might start, have. So they have the full, you know, the full round table experience. <laughs> sure. Well, let's start with you then. And why don't you tell us how we got here because we were going to do this live and uh, it was going to be di much different. That's yes. Fine. Yeah. So, um, so uh, yeah, so Brian, uh, as you know, but maybe some of the people popping on uh, don't, um, Women in Film and Video has very kindly uh, sponsored some of these Stonehenge auditions for the past couple of years, uh, sort of an in-person mass audition uh, where people come up, they have 90 seconds to do their monologue, next person comes up, we do it in groups of five, I sort of like speed casting instead of speed dating or speed job interviews, if you prefer. Um, but yes, then there was this, this thing, uh, global pandemic, uh, it's been in the news occasionally. I haven't, I haven't heard of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah, check it out. You'll, you'll see, okay. you know, you, you find a couple of articles and, um, yeah, uh, spoke with Melissa and all, and yeah, it just seemed like this, this was uh, much safer. Um, yeah, as, uh. COVID-19, I think, is doing for, for a lot of things. It's sort of showing you what you can do remotely or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so this was our solution uh, for I, this one. I had never heard of Zoom before this pandemic. Ah, yes. The things you learn. Very true. And so I assume this has been uh, affecting your business uh, quite a bit and the demand for actors have not been as uh, robust as in the past. Uh, yeah, I've actually had to uh, close down one of my uh, websites uh, that was specifically forecasting uh, simply because nobody's really been using it for the past few months. So. Yes. <sighs> <laughs> Well, we're Sad all in the trombone. same boat, I think. Yeah. I, yes, so. yes. Um, depending on, I, I can also uh, find, um, I know uh, Hollywood in general has opened up as of last Friday, uh, or a Friday or so ago, the 12th, rather, uh, June 12th. So it's over a week. Um, and uh, there was an industry publication, a white paper, uh, that was a collaboration between one of the producer groups and SAG-AFTRA that has some really nice guidance uh, about how to keep a safe, clean set, et cetera. Some of it doesn't apply, but uh, it's just nice that people are thinking about those things. Indeed. Yeah, so what's uh, coming up for a narrative uh, director's round table? Funny you should mention that. Um, we're actually having one in two weeks, uh, July 6th, with Michael Justin Lee and the uh, exciting field of edutainment. So it's a unique way yeah. of getting funding and producing movies that also have an educational element to them. So not just gunshots and uh, bikinis, but real learning is going on disguised as a movie. So I, I you know, I like that. Sure. It's always fun to learn. Grew up with PBS and educational board games and other things. Wow. How about you, Tara? Hello. Hey there. I'm doing pretty good. How are you guys doing? Good. What type of board games did you grow up with? Oh, I grew up with Monopoly. A lot of Monopoly and like, sorry. And I don't know if you guys heard of, was it called, I think it was called The Rat Trap or something? Mouse Trap. Mouse Trap. There we go. Mouse Trap. I loved Mouse Trap and Hungry Hungry Hippo. 
That was classic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bill and I actually, we did a film uh, seminar that used Mousetrap as a, uh, as a lesson in directing. Yeah, it was, we set it up so that basically the, we tried to find out constraints so the director cannot build anything themselves, but they're trying to provide instructions um, on doing things so like to, to have other people accomplish the task without being able to see the instructions and stuff themselves. Nice. I don't remember what other constraints we'd put on it at that point, but it was sort of a really neat exercise. I don't think anybody actually managed to assemble the full trap, but it was a, it was a, it was a start anyway. Oh, Did I it see. Make them um, better directors. Sherry says, "Yeah, Sherry Stroud. I uh, I played Candyland too. <laughs> Candyland. Monopoly was a fun game, but boy, it took too long. Yeah, and my brother always cheated, so." That may be why it took never, too long. never let him be a banker. No, it, uh, it took long, too long because it takes too long. By the way. Yeah, I still remember having an old uh, like Dark Tower game or whatever. It had sort of like the electronic tower in the center. And I, I have vague memories of it, but yeah. That's sort of they're, they're bringing that, that back. There's a group Are called they? Restoration Games that is doing an edition called Return to Dark Tower. Cool. I don't know when that's coming out, but yeah. it looks pretty darn cool. Yeah. All right, and just... Three more minutes of Phil. So yeah, welcome the, everybody who's uh, <laughs> checked in. Um, you get to see the preliminaries here before we actually start the official meeting. Mm -hmm. We're not starting right away to give people the time to check in. Plus, yeah. Melissa is doing some fancy troubleshooting for people who have uh, managed to lose the link and can't get in. So if you're wondering why we're not starting right away, that is it. So I am definitely encouraged by the number of people that we already have signed up here. So this is really yeah, exciting. 32 already. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, not, not just all TikTok people saying they were going to come and then <laughs> the last minute. Uh, yes. Yes. Right. So Francis, any uh, board games for you? I played a lot of the ones that turned out. Yeah. I didn't have very interesting board games growing up. Yeah. Um, does Magic count? Magic the Gathering? Because that came out when I was in high school. I, I think that does after a fashion. Collectible tabletop games, collectible yeah. card games. Yeah, I used to play Illuminatus as a little collectible card game, sort of pre Magic days. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember when I, I was in high school. Um, there was a, wait, is it, was it Illuminati? Well, there, yeah, there was well, this, Illuminati. Illuminatus is the yeah, novel. yeah, Illuminati. Yeah, game, right. And it's like so it wasn't had, a, yeah, it wasn't a collectible card game. It was like you could control. Yeah, they later did a collectible groups. card game yeah. edition of it. I remember the collectible card, card game. Yeah, I and it had some pretty girl. funny cards. Like uh, ah, yes. Oh. Now, which edition? This is important. Which edition D and D? Yes. I think mostly I played three point five. Okay. Yep. Very very. Uh, Solid. Well regarded ones there. Solid Basis edition. for Pathfinder. Yep. I, I am proud that both of my daughters are into a D&D now. So that's, that's sort of a, that's, that's a positive. <laughs> <laughs> and they're doing a lot of it through, through Zoom right now. They're actually doing yeah. a lot of interactions stuff like this, which is kind of neat because now a lot of their friends used to be able, they used to get together, but now they're able to get together with friends all around the country now. So people, a bunch of the people who moved out to California, they can still play together, which is kind of nice. Yeah, we're looking at doing that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So guys, you give us a few minutes with nothing with nothing uh, agenda, and we all turn into complete geeks. So. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, should, should should D &D there are of course you know film connections, not just the film Battleship, which is better left forgotten. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Oh, Joe says he met his wife at a game of D and D. Oh, <laughs> that's so, so adorable! Cute. I love it. Yes, and they're still together. <laughs> Hey, so, the, the family that games together. They, they haven't yeah. talked for years, but they're still <laughs> together. So it's good. All right. Well, nice. uh, it is now the official time to start. Welcome, everybody, to the directors, Narrative Directors Roundtable. We are a group that likes to do things like produce shorts. We haven't done a feature yet, but who knows what the future holds. Someday when the pandemic's over, we'll do the Narrative Directors Roundtable feature length movie. But for now, we are just making shorts uh, once we will be able to get back in to do it safely. So 
So that's our group is we put an emphasis on actually producing stuff. And that's why we have a heavy emphasis on actors and why we're so excited to have everybody here tonight. And since you uh, can't go out and get yourself filmed, we're gonna give you tips or my panel is, I'm not personally gonna, but <laughs> my panel is gonna give you some great tips. Some of whom you've all met before at uh, uh, previous meetings. Um, and I would also just like to add before I, I hand it off to this panel that, uh, as I said earlier, uh, for those who hadn't checked in early, uh, we are having a meeting in two weeks, July 6th, and it's Michael Justin Lee, and he's talking about edutainment. He makes feature-length movies that also educate you, so it should be very interesting. It's a unique way of getting funding, which is uh, more and more difficult nowadays, so that should be really informative. But tonight, we're going to focus on actors. So, Borg, I'm going to pass it to you, and I'll let you introduce the rest of the panel. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to briefly uh, share my screen here, too. Do, 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 do. Uh, uh, uh. So hopefully people can see this okay. Um, but uh, yeah, if you didn't get here right at the beginning, um, as I mentioned, uh, this was originally going to be another one of the Stonehenge sessions uh, of uh, in-person auditions. Uh, because of COVID-19 precautions, uh, we, we decided, okay, let's try and do something online um, and try to figure out of something that would still be useful for you all. Uh, and the big thing is that, well, everybody is being asked to do a lot more self-taping now. So this is hopefully valuable for you all right now, uh, even as certain productions are beginning to ramp up again uh, since, you know, about a week or so ago in Hollywood and then other places, uh, and then possibly for the future. And uh, at the end, we're going to uh, talk about... Um, talk about uh, uh, specifically if you guys want to do a self-tape audition for uh, the Stonehenge Auditions channel on YouTube. We're going to go into that. Um, but uh, yeah, this is basically what we've got uh, for general topics. Uh, as we go through, please feel free to ask questions uh, in the chat window, and we're going to try and get them uh, to you. Uh, if you can, you know, if you have a question, just ask it whenever. If it can align with this, that's groovy. If you have a really detailed question, uh, we might, we might say, okay, let's let's get to that because we're gonna speak to that a bit in, you know, in a little bit. So we're gonna try and get everybody's questions. We'll even have some additional Q and A as well. That's, so I just wanted to let you guys know some of that housekeeping. Um, for introductions. Uh, as you all probably know, my name is Bjorn Munson. My company is Team Jabberwocky. We've done uh, the Stonehenge audition since 2005 in one form or another. Um, a lot of my stuff now is, uh, I still do some casting support, not really anything for the past six months, uh, as it happens. Again, that, that crazy global pandemic. Uh, and uh, another project of Jabberwocky Audio Theater, so audio drama. Uh, with me is, in alphabetical order, is uh, Francis Abbey. Uh, he is uh, with the, and I'll, I'll stop sharing so you can see everybody's faces that much better, uh, is a graduate of the Savannah College of Art and Design. He's been uh, working as a filmmaker for about 15 years on... Uh, uh, shorts, features, and web series. Uh, his day job is as a digital media producer for Tegna. Uh, that's the company that uh, that owns and operates WUSA Channel 9 locally, as well as some others. Um, at the end, he might also speak about, uh, he also does work with headshots and uh, portraiture. So we'll, we'll explain a bit more of that at the end. Um, also continuing alphabetically, we've got William R. Coughlin. Uh, he's also a filmmaker of over uh, 15 years. Uh, he's been doing corporate video and communications for over 20 years, and he currently does editing, graphic design, and post-production work uh, via his company, Tohu Bohu Productions. Um, he is a graduate of that well-known party school, the College of William and Mary. 
Um, now, uh, my, for our, our last panelist here, certainly not least, we've got uh, Tara Garwood. Uh, she has been a filmmaker for over 10 years and an actor and gadget geek uh, for much, much longer. Uh, she is the owner of Banner Day Films, uh, she, which specializes in support for nonprofits and mission-based businesses. Uh, she's got a, if you go to her website, and we'll have all the links for everybody at the end, uh, or, you know, uh, panelists, feel free to, to drop links in the, uh, in the chat for everyone. Uh, she's got a great guide to foolproof phone videos. Some of those checklists and other things we're actually going to cover tonight. Um, so, yeah, so that's basically it. Um, if there's any topics that you're like, wait, I didn't see that in the agenda, and I was really hoping to cover that, uh, go ahead and put that in the chat. Uh, let us know. But uh, if you all are ready, I figure we could uh, go ahead and jump into gear. Uh, and oh, and Francis, yeah, Francis, if you want to share the video. Let me unmute okay. myself first. Okay. Um, I've been made a co-host of the meeting, so that makes this even more complicated. You have the powers of light and darkness. Yeah. All right. And, okay, everybody can see that. We're gonna hope that my internet connection speed is all right here. So I'll just introduce uh, a few words of introduction about this. Um, I've been on both sides of the casting process. I've auditioned for things and I've been uh, on the casting side of it. So I'm speaking about this process from, from with both those perspectives. And to anybody on the call right now who has experience with lighting, my apologies. This is just like really simple stuff, like a one lighting thing that can just add a little bit of extra oomph to your audition tapes. So with that said. Is it supposed to be this quiet? Let's see. I'm not hearing any audio. Yeah, I think we're stuck with it. But yeah. I'm going to share the link so everybody can watch. Yep. Yeah. And I, I shared it earlier. And in the email that we go out, um, <clears throat> we're, we're going to share it too. Uh, so, Francis, maybe just to pivot off of that. Um, Maybe just uh, you could, uh, you know, you could I can talk through commentary. This. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so the, uh, what you saw here early on, that's me lit my natural light. That's my big window right here on the side. And if you have a nice big window in indirect sunlight, it's really nice for lighting. And you can do that. You can use that for if you're recording an audition or in any circumstance where you're recording yourself. Nice big window, indirect sunlight, nice natural soft light. And big sources, big sources of light are going to be more flattering and they're going to look, make you look better. So you want to keep that in mind. And so if you don't have that option, then you can go with the ring light, which is what I'm showing you here, because that's it's a pretty inexpensive tool that you can purchase on Amazon. I'll show you the, where it is right uh, in a second. I've actually, that's what I've got on right now. I've got some natural light here and I've got my ring light on. Bill's got one. So it's a very handy tool. And, um, you know, typically, I think if you're familiar with them, a lot of vloggers use them, a lot of um, uh, like beauty, people who do beauty tutorials and things like that, they use them. And, and the ring design allows you to put your camera right in the middle and then shoot the light at your face. Now that's one look. I don't think that's like the best look for an audition. It's kind of a weird look. It's gonna look like you're doing a vlog or something like that. Um, it can be very flattering for you if you decide to do like a beauty tutorial or something like that. But um, this is what it looks like here on Amazon. You can see that that particular light, the newer 18 inch, we've got two kits in there. I think the difference is one comes with a bag. And, um, but for the money, uh, like a hundred bucks, it's a really nice versatile light that you can use. And um, uh, 
you know, especially for any, any kind of stuff like this, um, a Zoom meeting, be the envy of all the people in your Zoom meeting by lighting yourself well. And um, uh, auditions, it can help you out. Uh, because a lot of the additions that you see, what I was going to say is that anything you can do to give yourself a little bit of an edge in an audition, I think you should do it. Because um, having watched a lot of auditions, uh, there is like a fatigue that sets in after a time. And I think this is true with, if, you're, if you're like hiring or if you're doing, or if you're casting, it's kind of the same thing. After you start seeing a lot of resumes, a lot of things, you start to seem looking the same. So it's, you need to um, distinguish yourself. I mean, obviously, your, your performance has to be great, but uh, in some cases, you know, maybe it's like an industrial or something like that where performance isn't going to, the performances aren't going to differentiate that much. So anything you can do to give yourself a little bit of extra um, advantage as they do it. So that's um, where the lighting comes in. And, and then I'll show you here what if this thing blows. So we have a couple questions, Francis, oh, perhaps yeah. you can address while we're, we're sure. getting to your next thing. A couple people were asking or had a concern about uh, the ring light and wearing glasses. So. Yeah, right. And that's why another reason I would say, like, if you're auditioning in glasses, don't uh, don't put it in front of you. I like this is that look right here. This is what you've got. That's what you see. Now the intensity is not very high, but um, but you'll see it's kind of flat light. And if you're wearing glasses, yeah, it's going to make a ring right in your glasses, and it creates a very unique catch light. Catch light is the reflection in in the pupil of your eye you'll see that ring and it's a very, it's, it's an acquired taste, you know, some people like it and then other people are like, oh, that's weird. So, um, so those are things you want to be uh, cognizant of. And so that's why I like move the light over. Now that light is over to the side and I've got it set up, not directly in front of me, it's off to the side. The other thing is if it's directly in front of you, it is intense and it's hard to look right into the camera with that light. Um, one, one way around that is to like, light up the back of the room so you don't have just a bright light pointing in your face you put on some relief light in the room and that additional light will make it easier on your eyes in order to to record like that but my suggestion is to move the the light away from the front of the camera off to the side and then you can get this um you know a, a look that's i think like a fairly standard look and it's a nice starting point for um for anything almost really i mean like interviews and stuff like that to have that light just off um, off center and um, this is a one light setup so we're, we're not it's a key light only we're not doing fill we're not doing a backlight or anything like that it's just one light setup and and really that's like for for a lot of these things that's really all you need and um, here as you can see I've like started moving the light around and you can get like a more and more dramatic effect as you do that so depending on the mood of whatever it is you're auditioning for um, you can start to get like a more um, more and more dramatic look. So like you can cast like shadow over half your face and then have half of your face in light. And so that will help you to, um, like I said, if, you, if you're auditioning for a horror piece or something like that, you might wanna do that. But um, my suggestion would be at the beginning when you're slating and everything like that, have just kind of a nat normal look so that they can see your face and that um, for giving all that kind of introductory information that you look like you normally look. And then you can, if you have the flexibility, unless they give you very specific instructions in recording your audition video, just yeah. do a little something to make it unique. Yeah, we'll get a bit more into submissions a bit later on, but uh, Francis, actually, you've given me a couple segues over to Tara. One, she is a horror movie fan, uh, but uh, two, uh, she was gonna go over a lot of uh, tips with, uh, uh, with uh, taping with cell phones, and she had something that you mentioned in the video uh, about just hey, natural light. It's it's a yeah. given. It's a it can be very flattering. Uh, Tara, I know you also mentioned uh, natural light can be very very good, and of course, uh, you don't have to pay extra for it. It can be it can be helpful and useful if you are in a a state of weather where the sun is not coming and going on you, um, which hopefully if you're doing an audition and it's pretty quick, you should have some hopefully time where it's okay. But yeah, like uh, same placement as Francis was talking about, if you have a nice window and that's all you've got, just get it sort of at that angle to yourself. Um, I also have 
I don't use a ring light. I'm not like super fancy like that. I just have this guy. And it was like, I don't know, 60 or 70 bucks. Um, so it's a little bit cheaper and it, it dims, which is nice. Um, I have a feeling your ring light probably does too though. So it'll dim so you can sort of get it. So it's not too harsh if it, if full blast might be too much, but really if you don't have any of that, you can try with a lamp. I mean, if that's all you've got, just place it in that area and see how it works. Right now, I have, you can see I'm a little brighter on this side. I have a lamp off to this corner. Um, I did not fully light myself for this webinar, but I do have that little bit of an angle instead of it straight on, which can make you look flatter and thus wider which most of us don't generally want. <laughs> so, so that uh, angle gives you a little bit of sculpting. Uh, Tara, there was a quick question about the flat panel light you had. It, mm -hmm. just, can you provide a link to that or just explain oh, well, what the name would be if here somebody is a was link, looking it up? Here is a link to a bunch of useful gear that I would ah. probably mention tonight. How about uh, that? that? That sounds great. So I just put that in the chat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're saying, you are talking about flattening the light. Uh, what about uh, stuff like audio, since we talked a lot about light? Yeah, so we audio. Talk about audio. So I'll go, I have a lot of things to show for that too. I have toys today. Um, so if you're on a phone particularly, you can use, there's a few things. There's, um, instead of just your phone camera, because they're so weak, you need to stay very close to them, like probably within like two to three feet to really get at all decent audio. But you can also buy one of these little guys. Um, this is $59, it's the Rode VideoMic Pro. Again, it's in my list. And if you happen to be outside, he comes with a cute little dead cat or maybe a dead mouse, cause it's tiny. <laughs> um, if it's a geek reference, it's a Tribble, but yes. Yeah, or a Tribble, a Tribble if you're, if you're into Star Trek. Oh, how could I forget the Star Trek reference? Oh no, I'm so embarrassed. Um, or you can go with some, um, a lob if you want to go a little higher end. And there's these great easy lobs that Rode makes. If you can't tell, I really like Rode. They have these guys that are very simple. And if you tuck it inside your shirt, really all you can see is a little bit of it. <laughs> Bjorn, just, Bjorn just shared the link for what a triple is. I love it. I'm um, not going to assume people know. So. Or you can go a little higher end and grab one of these puppies with the transmitter and a receiver. So you have a really small lob that's unnoticeable. They're a bit more expensive though. So um, just, to, just to slow down a bit, uh, lob, short for lavalier. Sorry, uh, I believe that's, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> Which is for also those of you, like. yeah, if you see newscasters or television hosts and they've got that little uh, mic that's clipped perhaps to their tie or a collar mm -hmm. or their, their whatever their top might be, that's often a, a lot. Yeah. Um, but whatever you're using, you want to make sure that you don't have much background audio going on. Um, you know, ask your, your roomies, your family, whoever it may be, your pets, I'm eyeing my dogs down here on the floor, um, to keep it quiet while you're recording. Um, maybe even if it's, if it's making some noise, maybe even turn off your AC. That can be really distracting if it goes on in the middle of your audition. Um, you know, just think about all those things. Are there a lot of is that somebody mowing their lawn right outside? Maybe go to a different room where you're farther away from that. Or, or are there a bunch of cars going by? Try and find quieter spaces. Okay. Um, and you also mentioned uh, you're talking a bit more about setup. Um, mm -hmm. And I know you, Tara, I know you have some things about setup, but since we haven't heard from Bill for a while, I know you specifically were thinking, you, you mentioned some things earlier about uh, uh, camera angle, where it is, and some other things, if, if you wanted to expand yeah, on that. One of the big things that we run into a lot is people, uh, people tend to put their cameras fairly low. Um, if you're on a laptop or you're doing a, a, like right now, um, your laptop's at desk level looking up at you. I actually just had to edit a video recently where somebody had literally had their phone, vertical video, 
uh, on the computer looking up, basically pointing up at the ceiling and up their nose the whole time. Uh, so this was certainly not exactly the best looking video. And particularly when you're trying to make a good impression, that is absolutely um, critical. You know, you don't want to hurt yourself by that. Uh, so a few things that I always think about, number one, uh, so your camera, ideally you want to be at eye level, keeping in mind that your audience is looking at you, you're, you're having a conversation with your audience, you want to basically be at the same level that they are. Um, and so if you're using a laptop or a, 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 a phone, a camera, anything, something to prop it up a little bit higher so that it comes in at eye level is always uh, really helpful. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the ring light stuff is a great idea. Here's an example, like the environment I'm in right now, and this is just you know, me down in my living room where I tend to work, but I've got a lot of sort of a big light back to the side here. That's not great lighting, so I have that little ring light uh, here. And the ring lights are also really helpful. Again, you can dim as well, but you can also change color temperature. So for example, if I've got a regular white, I need to go something a little warmer, I can switch to that, uh, something cooler light. Um, there are lots of different options you can do with these. So they're really helpful. The, the links that the, the ones that Francis said are just a little more high end than this. This is a little cheaper one. Um, Actually, but again, if just I may, to, mm -hmm. Bill, you're wearing glasses and using right. And so, so it's got to be off to the right side now. or else you can't, you can't see. And even so, this is still a little close. Ideally, it would be a little bit further off to the side. Um, and I have a habit of doing like film noir lighting where I do everything off to the sides. <laughs> and other stuff, so, um, but that's generally not usually what you'll want to be doing for these types of auditions. Uh, as Francis said, if you're doing it very specifically for the piece, you want to think about what you're doing it for. So dramatic lighting and so on is great if that's what you're going for. But generally speaking, you're trying to convey uh, what your performance is. Uh, to Tara's point also, audio is critical. People will be much more forgiving of bad video than they will bad audio. Um, mm -hmm. Got to make yeah, sure you're clear. Um, and speaking of that, we do have a number of additional audio questions uh, from people. So I wanted to get that because we're still very much in the, uh, the gear zone. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question of just in general, uh, how does a mic work if you're using your phone? And I think a couple of you mentioned about that whole thing of automatic versus manual uh, settings. So, um, and, and like how you cut off the recording on your phone, like just that basic uh, type of, uh, type of uh, operation. Well, I know one of the things, obviously with the external microphones, you've got to plug it into your, if you, let's say you're using a phone, you've got to plug it into your phone. Particularly newer iPhones don't have a standard headphone jack anymore. So you need an adapter that can connect those. I had to put together a whole gear list for a bunch of people who are doing their own videos that I'll be editing together, but they're shooting their own stuff. And so you have to be sure to add those little extra elements to it. Um, uh, somebody mentioned in the chat the uh, Apple earbuds mic, which you know I have right here. I love these things. Unfortunately, my batteries are dead enough. They'll die in 45 minutes, so I couldn't use it tonight. So <laughs> it's like I would have been cut off halfway through. But these are fantastic, and it's actually a halfway decent microphone. It's actually not bad. Um, so th those work out pretty well as well. They're pretty easy. Um, Speaking of uh, brands, someone on the chat asked about the uh, U-Mic uh, brand uh, lavaliers. A any of you have experience with that? And then it, Tara looks like she's got something really cool to show. So like- Tara's got toys, it, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I always have toys. Yes, that's a good thing. But have any of you guys used uh, the U-Mic labs or can speak to that? I, I cannot. I have not. I've heard of them and I have heard that they are not bad, but I've not heard of that. I've not used that brand. All right. So then what were you about to show us? You had the, uh, you had the Tribble and the smartphone. Uh, yes, so oh, I was trying to put it on my, well, we'll show them in separate pieces. So <laughs> yes. this is um, what it looks like if you use this, this little shotgun mic. Mm -hmm. um, here, I'll take off the Tribble so you can actually see everything a little better. If you use this shotgun mic on top of the phone, I have an Android, so I still have an earphone jack, mm. ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> you may have to buy something from Apple um, to mm. get one with the lightning one. Um, but I also have this mount that goes on top of this, uh, the brand is called Joby, this one. This one, the brand is called Yulanzi. And it will go right on top of this so that you can actually mount your phone on it, which is a nice way, um, Bill was talking about getting some height or, you know, or stabilizing it too, right? Because if you just have it um, leaning up against some books, God forbid you get, you, you get angry in your big scene and you hit the desk and <laughs> the whole thing goes sliding down and you've just ruined the entire take and it was like the most amazing thing you've ever done. Um, the other nice thing about this is that, you know, you can 
you can bend these around. So it's really easy to get them wherever you need, wherever you want them. And these are in the, um, these are in the link that I provided too. Cool. Hopefully that helps. Um, let me, let me talk about, I, I see my friend Tony Quinn asking about um, Voya mics also. So those of you who are asking about particular brands of microphones and stuff, check YouTube, like seriously, like just type it in and reviews because because there are people out there and that's all they do is they get products and then they test them out and then they'll give you really good reviews about these things. So if you have any questions about a particular piece of gear, you can always just like go to YouTube, type in whatever review and then you can find out. Um, uh, there, there's some that are fantastic, like somebody did a comparison of five different um, you know, like cardioid mics or something like that and it was terrific. So that's my suggestion. If there's a, a particular thing you want, it's like, is this any good? You can find out. Yeah, I, I'd echo that too. I found when I wanted to know more about particular types of cameras, you do a little bit of hunting. So, you know, budget a little bit of uh, uh, down the YouTube rabbit hole uh, for yourself. But uh, some of those videos, I think what I really like is not only do they give you all the specs and their impressions, but they really give you an idea what they're good for and what budget level. And, and that, that can be very valuable. I think what you often find is uh, there isn't one answer for gear uh, for any of these things. It's what's going to work for you or work well enough. It, it, in some cases, uh, when you're going through the, the self-taping, there's a lot of considerations we're going through. Uh, but think of, I, I guess, I think I learned this from uh, screenwriter John August, the IKEA principle. It works for now. Yeah. Um, yeah, a couple, couple of notes out here. I think like, people are like, can you wear uh, ear pods to an audition? Anything that's visible is, if it's not distracting, I think you can probably get away with it. Um, the key is that you don't want anything that's going to distract from yourself. In terms of how to remotely turn your phone on and off, was another question that came up from Michael. Um, you can... There's, there are some remotes, some Bluetooth remotes, some devices and things come with those. Tara's probably got something out there for that. Um, mm -hmm. but, the, uh, but alternatively, again, if you're recording, you, know, you can go ahead, hit record, go get your phone set up, wait, then come in. You can do some, some minor editing directly on your phone. So basically, even if you don't have any other editing capabilities, you still have the ability to trim the beginning, trim the end. So err on the side of recording extra stuff. Recording space is cheap. So go ahead and get your phone set up. I had to record, my wife works with the Fairfax County Library System and they had to do a bunch of uh, book talks. And so we would do those and we record those just with my iPhone. They were just easy enough to do that. And I've got more professional gear here, but that was just an easy way to do it. Well, you just record and then you just trim it later. Um, now people who have full on stuff, like I do all of my audio recording separately. I record a totally separate Zoom recorder, um, no connection to Zoom, the, the service here, but a separate recording device and then sync that later. But that's overkill for most people. This is, I'm, I'm an editor, so that's easier for me. It's honestly easier for me to work that way. But there are things you can do in terms of using some of these devices with your iPhone. You can get adapters from Apple. Tara mentioned briefly um, that there, you can get something and you can, and they're not that inexpensive. Basically the, the regular headphone jack goes into one end and the lightning jack goes into the other. Um, and you can also get different apps. You can record with just the built-in iPhone uh, recording capabilities uh, or Android recording capabilities. Those are probably fine for most things you can do. Ideally, you want to be able to have some control over uh, exposure and so on. But, um, but yeah, for the most part, those will work fine. And you just trim them. Just trim yeah. them. So uh, you mentioned some things with the phone of storage is, is cheap. Uh, Tara, I remember you had some notes in your checklist about making sure about phone power and storage, right? Yes. So phone setup. So um, you want to make sure, you know, first that you're in focus, right? So remember to, uh, this is a little, sometimes a little tricky and you might need to go into manual to set the focus. It's a little tricky to get far enough back, lean in and tap on your cell, tap on the thing to make you in focus. So you might need to fidget a little um, to get yourself in focus and get the, the um, exposure set properly. Um, and uh, also definitely make sure that you have your phone fully charged or better yet plugged in you don't want it to die on you while you're doing this especially if you're like doing multiple takes as you go um offload your extra video files like and photo things like that like just put them in google drive or apple cloud icloud i forget what it's called i haven't been an apple person in a long time sorry icloud whatever it's called um 
offload them so that you have space for that video that you're making. And this is a, a big one that I sometimes forget. Restart your phone and then put it in airplane mode because there's nothing that's going to screw you up more in the middle of an audition than getting a text like right while you're doing it and you're looking at your phone and you're like seeing it vibrate or hearing it bing or whatever. So go into airplane mode just for the time that you need to do this. You can, you can be incommunicado for that little bit of time. Um, plus, if once it happens once, you're going to worry about it the, sec the next time you record and you're going to keep thinking about it. And it's just going to make you, it's for me at least, it makes me like a little fidgety and stressed. Um, and clean your lens. Wipe out your lens. You can use like a glasses um, little fabric thing, like just mm -hmm. a little microfiber cloth, I believe. They Micro call it. There you go. Words it needs to sound. Yes. <laughs> Yarn has the words for my, for my jumbled thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. Uh, we're about time where we wanted to switch gears. We had uh, rough things about, uh, yeah, I, sorry. That was an unintentional pun. Uh, that's how my brain works. Uh, let's see. I think we've covered a lot of the stuff, uh, there was one of the there as well. that I wanted to cover with gear, um, mm -hmm. in terms of setup and arrangement. The um, it was a cheat I had previously for. If I'm not auditioning for a narrative piece or not something where I'm audition, doing a monologue, because I've I've done some like uh, uh, you do some announcer stuff like this, or where you have to read a large portion of text, and you just, and I don't have a teleprompter at home, so I can't quite do that. But I actually rigged a setup where you could basically keep in mind, you know, use just use my laptop as the script piece, but actually position the camera right above my laptop to the point where I'm bringing the lens down so that it's it's barely on there. And I was using an actual DSLR camera, so I could actually bring the ca camera almost below the top edge of the laptop. So my island is still really close to the camera and I'm able to read a lot more text. Um, it's not quite exact. It's like, you know, if you look right now, if I'm looking at my computer screen, you can sort of see my eyes aren't quite looking at the camera, which is up here. Um, but it's a close enough cheat. If you're doing something that's specifically that type of audition, that type of piece where you need to have that, it's a neat little, uh, a quick trick you do. And I set up um, just with, you know, stacking stuff on books and stuff like that, make sure that it all looked good. I actually stack two tray tables on top of each other to get my levels proper and so on. So there are a little, you know, I've got a little uh, a, a jury rig set up here if, when I need it. But. And that reminds me of one more phone tip. Don't look here. Yes. Look here. Look where the lens is. On your iPhone, I think it's up here. So if you look in the middle, it like, like Bill was just showing you, um, if you look in the middle, if I'm looking in the middle of my computer, it looks like I'm looking down. If I look in the webcam, it looks like I'm looking at you. So, I mean, sorry, here. Yeah, <laughs> here. <laughs> and that's something, that's something if those of you who have attended a mass audition before, uh, you may remember, like, cause I'm usually the timer uh, that leads you in. And I, I ask people to, uh, unlock their knees and breathe. And whenever I do that, at least one person I can see they've, they've been locking their knees and it's natural, right? So yeah, I, I would suggest when you're doing that, make sure you breathe and you locate where, where the camera is. You've probably been watching us right now tonight where we seem to be looking down and then up. Like my camera for my, uh, my desktop, because I'm actually using a desktop, is up here. Uh, but then everybody's faces, and then the chat is over here. So that's why my eye line is doing that. And, and that probably is then a good segue to presentation uh, because that's something you want to practice and you want to feel comfortable with uh, because for that moment, for that one minute audition or what have you, you want to be focused in on uh, what people are seeing. So. Um, so yeah, again, I will just say, uh, we're going to, I will quickly do this. Now just remember, so now we're going to switch things just ever so slight. We're going to, we're going to talk a bit more about, uh, the, the overall presentation, wardrobe and makeup. We're still going to get, uh, cover stuff with, uh, with, um, uh, monologue picking, but, uh, coming off of the gear and the lighting, you'll see. Uh, right here, I've actually got, it's, um, it's a floor lamp that has five different separate lights that I can control. 
and they're all bouncing off the wall. But if you have spectacular, spectacular lack of hair like I do, uh, even if you're a guy, you might want to consider some powder to get some shine off of there or off your nose, uh, et cetera. But you really don't need to do much, I would say. And, and then again, people understand that this is a, um, people understand that this is an audition. You're not necessarily fully made up. You're not gonna have the full costuming of whatever the character you have is in many cases. Um, but uh, yeah, how about we start, uh, Tara, you were, we were talking earlier today about uh, uh, makeup and considerations uh, there for, for these self-tape auditions. Sure, well, as you said, powder, powder is good. Um, if you don't have powder, at least tap yourself off with a, with a tissue or something. Um, which I have not done today <laughs> um, for for lady types. Um, generally, like just natural street makeup is good. Um, if you want to give a feel for the character, for example, if you're playing a goth, you can maybe go a little that direction, but I wouldn't go like full force all the way in because we still want to see you. Um, so yeah, that's basically what I'd say about makeup. Um, just, you know, not too much. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a good thing too that uh, touches on something Francis mentioned earlier about how people should look and look how you'd actually look. Uh, Francis, if you wanna speak to that. Yeah, I don't think that you want to like misrepresent yourself. Just like with your headshot, you want your headshot to be representative of how you really look, right? So I feel that your audition tape should also be representative of how you really look. So you don't want to alter your appearance so much that it, it does not resemble you anymore. Because I think then uh, anybody who's casting you is going to be in for a shock when you walk in and be like, wait, who, who are you? So. Yeah, I, I do remember I've done some casting sessions with Francis and, and I will say he is an incredibly nice guy. But um, even he sometimes, I still remember one time where somebody came in and they gave an audition and all that. And you're like, that's great. But, and then you held up the headshot. Who is this person? <laughs> because it looked nothing like them. So, you know, for self-tape auditions, that's less of a necessarily a clear and present danger. But Honestly, yeah, you, you need to look how you actually look in some way or fashion. It shouldn't be a guessing game. Uh, we did have a couple uh, detail questions about makeup uh, and such already. Um, uh, where and what to buy for powder and is eye makeup for women important? I guess that's to me. Um, yeah. Well, powder, I, I just say go to CVS so or for, whatever. For, for gentlemen, ladies, all, all people, um, you can always, for powder, go to Ben Nye. They have a translucent setting powder um, that, that should just look invisible. It just sort of soaks up any, any shiny on your face. Um, also, Sephora, man. I love, or Ulta, there's other places like that, but I love Sephora because I go in there and they like advise me. I can be like, help, what will match my skin? and they can show you and, and help you find stuff that will work and they'll, they'll you know, test it on you so you can get a feel for it, see if it's comfortable, all that stuff. Um, what was the other question? I think there was another makeup question. Um, uh, you mentioned I, eye makeup, yeah. Eye makeup. I would do something on your eyes. I would not necessarily say that you have to go like all out. But like even today, I'm not wearing makeup, so I'm not really a great example. I'm wearing a little bit of lip color and mascara. <laughs> but I would do a little bit more than what I just did today. I would do a little eyeliner, you know, a little mascara at least. Just something because we don't want to lose your features um, in the shot. Um, we want to, especially if your eyes are your best feature, play that. Mm, you know what? Um, yeah. Like... <laughs> I just realized I don't know if this is a uh, if this is a G rated if this is PG or 
<laughs> I think YouTube we're so far we're fairly family friendly. Yeah. So maybe you want to play that. Maybe up. you want to keep that. Yeah. Play that up. If that's you know, if eyes are your thing, play them up. If lips are your thing, do it. Like, show us your best you. Yeah, that's actually a a good segue into monologues. But I do want to touch. We haven't really touched on, and I know uh, all of you have mentioned stuff about uh, framing. And, and wardrobe, I did want to mention, wardrobe, it's the same as with Stonehenge auditions. I would just do what's evocative. You don't want, it doesn't have to be exact. You mainly don't want people, uh, you don't want whatever you're wearing to take people out of whatever the monologue that you're doing. So for instance, I've got a collared button down shirt. Any professional monologue, done. T-shirt, flannel shirt, Maybe that's a working class monologue. It's just that simple. It really doesn't have to be that complicated. You know, if you're playing a soldier, don't wear a three-piece suit. Um, and then actually, uh, Francis, I think you had one fun thing with, uh, with uh, wardrobe too, that, you know, if you want to take it up a notch. Yeah, it was actually, well, this was a callback. And I actually got instructions from uh, the writer who was the writer and producer to like, he's like, where it was, it was a um, prisoner at Guantanamo Bay. And he says like, wear some kind of uh, prison uniform. So I went out and got some orange scrubs that I wore for the audition. And I was right there. I had a very fun time telling Jordan about that entire casting experience. It's actually my, my favorite casting experience, even though I didn't get the part. So. Yeah. Very cool. And then uh, Bill, I think you mentioned something about Everybody, like all of us as filmmakers, <laughs> you know, vertical versus horizontal. <laughs> yeah, uh, anything it's, mentioned there? It's it's a it's a it's a trade off, and that's one of the things that that honestly, I'm I'm a widescreen purist, and particularly since, and my thinking is that people who are reviewing your auditions are likely going to be watching it on a widescreen device. So theoretically, and of course, I've edited stuff for Instagram TV and stuff like that that is intentionally vertical video. That stuff is meant to be, and it's supposed to be, and you compose for that. Um, I'm curious from all, any of the other panelists as to whether you've had any additional or alternate thoughts, particularly if I'm doing a, a Tara, I think you've mentioned before that you like to see in terms of framing, not necessarily just a, like a quick close up of just your face, but something that's a little wider so I can see your performance, your movement, your, your overall structure, um, which of course might also lend itself to vertical video. And I don't know if anybody has any alternate thoughts about that. Um, so I, I also prefer widescreen um, unless you are auditioning for that film that is shot in portrait, <laughs> which I doubt you are. It, it seems yeah. unlikely, um, but you could be. There are some. I want to see you how I'm going to see you on film. If, if I'm going to shoot you widescreen on film, I want to see you in a widescreen shot. And But I personally, I like to see like a little bit of a wider shot, like maybe waist up so that I can see your physicality. I can see your size, your things that don't necessarily show up in a headshot, right? I want to see you, not just your, not just your face, not, not like even where I am right now. Like I would want wider than this. I'm actually adjusting my gestures <laughs> to the frame for you because <laughs> I talk with my hands. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um, my hands. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's a very good thing. And it's one of the things, reasons I've enjoyed the in-person Stonehenge auditions for so long is I get to see the actor's body language and their physicality as they get up into that very small square, etc. Now, for a self-taped audition, you are that, uh, that small square. Uh, so I would think too, and then, hey, maybe this is our segue here, is depending on what your monologue is, make sure your framing is in such a way that any physicality you have can support the monologue further. Can I, yeah, I would say yeah, too, just in the vertical versus horizontal debate, I think that if, if the piece is calls for vertical video of some kind, they're going to tell you and they'll say, mm -hmm. please shoot a vertical video for us. Because there are some auditions that will say, it's like, send us a headshot and a selfie. I've actually heard where they'll say, it's like, send us a selfie because they want to see what that selfie looks like. And I guess, because mm -hmm. it's going to capture a different aspect of your personality. And that is a very specific kind of photo. So I think that 
if they want that, they'll ask you for it. So otherwise, just assume that it's 16 by 9 horizontal, unless, uh, unless otherwise specified. And I think there's one or two more things we may want to say about, about framing in general. Um, for example, put where, you know, where do you put yourself? Do you put yourself center? Do you put yourself over to the side? Um, I don't have any headroom right now, right? So you probably want to give yourself <laughs> a little space above your head, but you don't want your head to be completely in the center with tons of space above you because that takes the focus off of you. I mean, you can see it right here. If I'm down here, as opposed to if I'm up here, the focus is very different, I think. I see it. <laughs> um, as a, and you'll be auditioning for filmmakers and they will see it. Um, yes. So pay attention to your headroom, pay attention to your room. If you decide to put yourself off to a third, don't face to where, like, unless, unless you are doing it for a specific reason, okay? All rules are meant to be broken. You just have to know why you're breaking them. Unless mm -hmm. you're doing this for a really specific reason, give me this. <laughs> this is just the more natural way to see people in a frame. Yeah, the and that actually face. might be, uh, I'm sorry, Francis, you had one oh, thing? I was, I was gonna just build on that and say, yeah, the more you can do to make, to make it look like you're in the movie, the better it is for me, the filmmaker, I think. Because I said to Bjorn, I, I dislike auditions from the artificiality standpoint. Right? Because like, especially if it's like a poorly lit thing or something and they're, and they're just reading in a room off of, uh, if, like if it's a cold read, I mean, this isn't a cold read that we're talking about necessarily, but I mean, it's, it's, you have to suspend disbelief a lot. So I feel like the more you can do to show like the filmmakers and the casting directors and everything like that, if it looks like a movie, it's going to be easier for them to picture you in that part. And I, think, I feel like that just makes it easier for them to like, Sure thing is like yeah I really like that yeah and, and that's actually a good thing I believe we had a question in the chat earlier about hey should you look at the camera or otherwise and and I usually say for the in-person auditions hey it depends on what the monologue is honestly most of the time if you're doing narrative you're not looking right at the camera right you're going to be talking to a scene partner night like this. Right now I'm looking at a speaker right next to my camera and I'm making sure the eye line, that's now their nose is, is, the, uh, is the woofer there. And uh, hey, that works. Um, you still wanna see the face, of course. Um, and, and then you might even do a test recording with if you're doing a smartphone and say, yeah, does that look good? Okay, let me mark it and then you're gonna take it again. Um, we did have another question. What if they want a full body video in landscape? How do you do this with an iPhone without showing too much extra background? I, my first guess is you don't. You have to see the extra background. I, I, think, I think so. I mean, yeah. there, there are editing <laughs> tricks you could do if you want to do something. Again, if you're bringing it to post-production, you can blot things out. Um, but I think realistically, you have to position the camera such that it's catching the shot you want. Now, when they say full body, that may or may not mean like literally your full body head to feet. Um, I would make sure you give your head shot and then you go down, you, you know, cut yourself off of the knees or whatever if you absolutely have to. Um, I hate those shots in general, but for this type of thing, that might work to not get too far out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that would sort of be the option there. And again, pick a background that's not going to be distracting. Part with all of this stuff is you don't want anything that's distracting from your performance. You want it all to enhance it. So as Francis talked about the, the, the orange jumpsuit or whatever for that, because that was enhancing that performance. It wasn't mm -hmm. distracting. I don't want anything. Uh, you know, I have a habit. Uh, I'm obsessive. I look at a thing and I'll see a, a book on the shelf. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting going, oh, hold on. What is that book? I think I have that book. Do I, I know that. I think I recognize that. If I'm in that mode, you've lost me because mm -hmm. I'm distracted and I'm watching something else or really like a loud or garish outfit or anything that makes me go, why did they choose that? that sort of like takes me out of the moment. You want to make sure not to do anything like that. And it yeah. really helps when you're trying to check that stuff if you actually run camera on it and mm -hmm. look at it in the screen. You, there are things that you will not notice. You will say, oh, I know that the frame goes from here to here, but you will not notice it when you're looking at it just with your eyes. You will notice things when you look at the screen at that shot. Um, so definitely like do a test shot and make sure and make sure like I have like a corner of a, <laughs> a corner of a picture sticking out of my head. Like make sure you don't have tons of stuff like where it looks like a plant is growing out of you or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have a, a question of any, any recommendations for a screen as a background. 
I, See, I, I, I like this screen myself, actually. This is... Well, that, that type of thing is fine. I think like, don't do, don't, 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 don't ever do. I mean, I like Zoom has all these preset backgrounds. You can stick with an aquarium behind you. Never, 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 never do that. <laughs> do, do not do anything like that. You want to talk about distracting? That is hugely distracting. Don't do any tricks. I mean, this is just simple. This is, this is my living room here. It's easy. It's blank white background. This is not the best composition. I, I would probably wouldn't use for an actual audition. I would try to find something a little darker so it's less emphasis in the background. But again, don't do anything that's going to be um, outright distracting. Don't try to green screen anything. Don't do anything yeah. that, that's, that's ridiculous. It's not about the screen, green screen. It's not about the background. It's about you. So yeah. make the background way, way less important. I do think Bill wins least distracting background. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Well, a lot of times my cat will walk back through here, but uh, but not not now. So. <laughs> All right. So uh, with that, so we we've talked about uh, presentation, probably uh, you know going more towards uh, here. I can even look at a corner of the desktop rather than right at you guys. Um, though you know, depending on that, maybe that's really important. Um, I was going to do a really deep. Trek reference, but I won't. Uh, so let's do monologue. Uh, so let's talk, yeah, so let's talk about monologues, what you might want to uh, um, uh, choose. Uh, I, I would say, and then Francis, how about we start with you? Uh, we talked about, uh, like, like I've recommended from uh, Stonehenge, choose something, and this is assuming it's not, they're not giving you the part, you get to choose, like, those of you who won't want to do a self tape audition uh, later on uh, yeah. can do. Choose something that plays to your strengths. Right. Yeah. So I mean, you you kind of you should have an idea of what your performance style is like, and just personality wise, who you are, and and what what roles also that you want to play, but realistically that you you know it's like uh, something that's this. Like I, I personally, for my uh, one of my appearances at Stonehenge, I did a Billy Crystal from, uh, well, not Billy Crystal, but the character from When Harry Met Sally, and uh, so very neurotic and you know a guy like that, fast talking sort of thing, and so that worked for my own personality and and my acting style and everything like that. So you know, if you're gonna have that one monologue in your pocket, make sure it's something that that fits you, and and you know I wouldn't do something that's like. Uh, I don't know, um, Brad Pitt from uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or something. Maybe it would, but uh, yeah, it'd be a stretch. Yeah, so. I, with that too, in general, uh, I always, there has been, every single Stonehenge, somebody picks a well-known monologue, and by that I mean a monologue that you know specifically the actor delivered in which movie. Like, so this is like a Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth, from a few good men. And you hear them start that and it's just like, you've set the bar so freaking high. I have seen out of however many thousands of auditions, I've seen that work once where somebody did uh, Red's Morgan Freeman's um, monologue from Shawshank Redemption. But still, it was like, well, you really needed to be on that guy's side. So yeah, that, that's another thing. Um, but but with uh, Francis, with what you're saying, I, I'd agree. It's like, you might be able to, in fact, those of you who are the actors out there probably can play several types. For if you're doing a general monologue, like for Stonehenge, pick a type, then find the monologue that supports that. Uh, Bill, I, I, I think you were talking a little bit about that, about... Uh, about uh, both specific roles and, and choices for those roles? Yeah, uh, I think uh, some of the points, uh, you wanna make sure that your, um, your overall audition, everything you do supports that character. The, if you're going for a specific role that you're picking a monologue, or if, if you're just doing a general Stonehenge audition, you're picking something that's, that's neat. And of course, I see actors come to Stonehenge auditions year after year and do different auditions. Um, and do very different parts. That's fantastic, different monologues. You're showing range there. But you wanna make sure that if I'm looking for a very particular type of role, I'm picking something that's close to that. Um, thinking in terms of what, what, um, what I'm trying to go for. If I'm trying to play generally, let's say, um, in my case, robots. I do a lot of robots. So <laughs> I might like, pick something that, that, that lends itself to that rather than trying to go a wild you know, 20 something action hero, which you know, I can't quite pull off anymore. 
So <laughs> those, those types of things I think are, are really important. Another thing to think in terms of this is we have a, a lot of people will do their, they'll think that I'm just going to write my own piece. Um, ah, yes. Oh, I'll let you say your thing and then I will give my answer. Yeah. The, um, and, 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 and every once in a while it does work. So I'm, I'm not going to, you know, if, if you're a stand-up comedian and you write your own material and this is what you do, great. But the key with your audition is we are trying to evaluate you as an actor. Two things in that. Number one, I just want to see what your acting ability is. I don't want to judge your writing um, or your singing, if it's not a singing part, um, your songwriting. And let's say you're a great actor, but you're not really a great writer, then, or not great at writing for yourself even. Uh, then suddenly you're distracting from that because I'm, I'm now judging your writing in addition to your acting. And in fact, you could have gotten the acting role, but you didn't because the, the writing was distracting. It gets back to that same distracting thing as well. Um, and, and, and we're also trying to see, you're trying to usually convey, to, you're trying to play a part. Yeah. If you've written something for yourself. That's great. That shows me you can write your own thing. But yeah. you're usually not doing that. You're, I want you to play a role that I've already written. I've already got the script here. So, so yes. Yeah. So I will be more blunt. Don't. <laughs> don't by all that you hold dear do not do a monologue that you wrote yourself don't just don't here's where you do that this is the one place where you do that and it's not at stonehenge or any place else if you want to be the next rachel bloom and, and what if one of you can put in there, you guys know who Rachel Bloom is. She did a whole bunch of online YouTube or other things about her singing, her comedy, et cetera. And then that parlayed into my crazy ex-girlfriend. That's the bar and that's the reason you do your own thing. For anything else, all of you who have been through acting training, you know this. Your job is to make somebody else's writing come alive. Your job is to be somebody other than you, whether it is the lead character or mailman number four or detective so-and-so or whatever it is, you are supposed to go to the text and be another character. And when, even though you might be, know your type well, and even if you might be able to write well for yourself and God help you if you can't even write well for yourself and you do your own monologue, so that's the whole double fail that Bill was talking about. That's not the point. It is 100% not the point. So with that caveat, yeah, you can do it, but don't. I think Bjorn should like, you know, you need to make your list of like the top 10 things you definitely shouldn't do at Stonehenge. And that's, that's on there along with don't oh do my a God. monologue. It's um, just... I'll say it's like somebody who's like, who writes, I've written my own films and stuff like that. I would never do that. I would never go into a, an audition situation and say like, I wrote this. Because like you, my, when I hear that, my eyes are already rolling by the time the person opens their mouth. Yeah. And I think that like, um, you've set the bar so impossibly high for yourself. And what you've also said is like, you, you basically come in and said like, I have an enormous ego and here's this thing I created that I'm gonna read for you now. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's ill-advised for sure. Yes, that, now, I'm not going to get as version. yeah. I'm not going to get as angry as Bjorn did here because <laughs> it would be really hard to top that. Um, but again, one of the things about this is I want if I'm looking for actors, I want people who are serious about it, who've done their um, done the, the the homework, so to speak. I've looked I've, I've looked to try to find monologues. When I write something, it's like I didn't look to try to find anything that would be appropriate. I didn't do the work there. Now sometimes it can be really obscure. It can be hard to do that. That's all fair. Uh, and again, I'm also a writer and stuff, so that, that's sort of a, um, that's, that's my instant crutch is like, oh, but I, I wrote this great character. I'd love to do that part. Okay, step back. <laughs> don't, don't, uh, don't do that. Um, but again, it's, it's sort of a sign that I might not have done as much effort into it. And I want somebody who's going to come and do the effort and actually treat things seriously. There are, and I've worked with people who are not experienced actors. This does not mean you have to be a great classically trained actor or anything like this. You can come in and just have a great personality and have a natural affinity for playing very particular characters. And that's great. I will, I've cast people in those types of roles before. That's fantastic. But I want to see that you're serious about it and you're actually going to do the work involved. The other yeah. implication is that if you cast that person, are you going to be able to read the script that somebody else wrote? Or are you going to be like, no, you know what? I would like to write all my own dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, the Edward Norton a, a problem, right? Oh, yeah. God. Okay, yes. I want to jump on the don't train. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to do a don't. I would say, the kind of monologue I would say, too, that 
not all monologues are good audition monologues. Not all speeches are good for auditions. If you have to explain your monologue to me before you do it, that may be a hint that it's not a great audition piece. Like yeah. I should be able to get everything I need to know from hearing your piece. And if you don't think that, that you're going to be able to get your, your, the people you're auditioning for to do that, then you might want to look for another piece. Yeah. And that's something that I, I always advocate that actors basically in, in whatever your schedule is, that you have basically, you have some dedicated uh, research and development time because uh, uh, Tara going off of what you're saying, you might find a character that you're like, oh, I so want to play that character. Like uh, another geek reference, I'd love to play Enoch from Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. That's just like, oh, that's in my, I know, uh, Bill might not, might too, because he's a, yeah, robot. a robot or, <laughs> or a Chronicom. Yeah, but anyway, um, realize that you might find the right character, but obnoxiously, they don't have a good monologue. You might have something that you know you are good at, uh, but you can't find, you know, it, but the speech doesn't translate to monologue. That, that's sort of, and it's just kind of unfair because um, you're probably not wrong if you identify, ooh, this is the type of scene I think I could rock in. This is the type of speech pattern, the type of character I could rock in. So you just need to be patient and keep on doing your research and accumulate uh, monologues that you can practice and get better at that are going to present all those different types you are and then start doing them, practicing them at, at some of these mass audition opportunities. Now, there's a question kind of related to what we're talking about now from uh, Karen Siobhan asking if you can do a classical um, monologue for an audition situation. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, but for TV or film, uh, historically, there's been only gr one group that actually likes the classical training a lot more, at, at least since the, the 30s or 40s. And that's back in the 90s with the casting directors for the various Star Trek series, uh, because they found the people who could speak Shakespeare and iambic pentameter fluidly, they could handle techno babble like a boss, uh, or apparently speak Klingon. Uh, but other than that, I'm afraid um, a lot of film and TV people are kind of, I can't really call it snobby because I mean, come on, it's the classics. They're almost like reverse snobby. They, they don't like it. And then here's the thing too. Um, a lot of stage stuff and certainly classical is very heightened. So uh, and, and then if any of you guys have the chance to see the 1970s movie version of Equus, don't. Uh, because Equus is such a wonderful stage play and film is such a naturalistic medium, it just, it doesn't work. So there, that said, I think there are many playwrights that lend themselves to a much more understated mm -hmm. uh, film version. So you could basically, the writers have written something that you could do either as a stage version, uh, talking as loudly as I did, you know, a bit earlier, uh, or, or a film version. So like August Wilson, I've seen some beautiful TV film versions of August Wilson monologues. Sam yeah. Shepard, uh, what, what would be, Tara, you Mammoth. looks like you've got some things. Mammoth, yeah. yeah. Mammoth bleeping does. We're going to keep it family friendly. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Francis, Bill, other ones? Uh, my biggest thing is just, I think you can, you can take something where the dialogue is very heightened if you are capable of bringing it down to a film performance, um, which is basically much more naturalistic, much more uh, uh, subtle nuance, not stage. I mean, this is not big stage performance. Um, all that said, and there was a question also, do we do it for auditions, like material taken from film or TV versus, or books versus theater? I usually prefer theater monologue stuff's taken from a play as opposed to a film or TV. The reason being, as we mentioned earlier, um, as Bjorn we mentioned earlier, as soon as you pick something that's known or that's familiar with film, you're comparing yourself to that performance. 
um, and you generally don't want to do it. I've seen some that have done very well because they're doing something radically different than the earlier performance. Uh, but I want to see you. And sometimes with theater, with theater monologues, I find it a little easier to make that transition to, to separate, to detach from a previous performance I might have seen and really look in the moment, as opposed to film monologues, which I go, oh, this is you know, you're doing you know, oh, John Travolta even, you know, just any kind of iconic performance it doesn't have to be a, a great classic one, but you're comparing yourself to that immediately, which can be a strike against you. Yeah. What do you guys think about books? I'm pretty uh, source agno agnostic, but yeah, I I I love uh, if you can find a first person book. Like I actually had a monologue in my wheelhouse that was uh, from Samuel Beckett's Malloy, which is a first person book. Now Beckett also was a playwright, of course, so it was just an easy uh, easy thing. But I mean, yeah, any first person book uh, or or there's got uh, substantial dialogue. There might be that. The one trick I would be careful of is you want it probably to be more contemporary, uh, which is something even with the stage plays, I would say. Uh, I remember doing scene work uh, from a play from the 40s, and there's just a rhythm and cadence of the, um, uh, of the dialogue uh, that is different uh, than it is now. So. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily pick a book from the 1890s or something, but, uh, but yeah, you might find um, short stories, books, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's definitely good. And then it, it does fulfill the whole thing of people haven't necessarily heard it before. Yeah. Um, episode 17 of a TV series from not the lead character. That's fair game. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've got a, I've, you know, for when I get a bit older, I've got a President Dalton monologue for, uh, for Madam Secretary that I'll, I'll, I'll happily roll out. So yeah, that goes back into the, the um, research and development. See if you can start accumulating some of these things from, I, I'm also source agnostic for the yeah. most part. I, and you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a horrible crime and, and film noir buff. So obviously you gave me old, old Dashiell Hammett stuff like that. It's very stylized and you have to be going for that type of thing. Um, but that type of stuff, even if it's, again, that's a lot of first person uh, of storytelling. So you can do that. The key is you can, you can do whatever uh, format works that you can convey as an actor. But the key is, again, make sure that it's, uh, uh, again, to get back, you're not writing your own stuff. You're not customizing your something. You're taking something from a source that is, is established, that, that exists, that is somebody else's voice that you are bringing life to. But it can mm -hmm. be from a book. It can be from TV or film, again. But just you don't want to, you don't want to have people immediately comparing you to an existing performance. Um, so let's see, du, 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 du. I think we're, yeah, we've done a bunch of stuff with monologues. Um, oh yeah, so interesting, I mentioned in the chat, hey, you know, you can be loud, but don't let your mic clip. So this is sort of a callback to uh, thing. Did, did my sound get kind of digital and bleh, when I was, you know, ranting? I don't think so. Okay, I didn't know it was crystal clear. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, hey. So, okay. Good vocal control on mine. I wouldn't have guessed that. I, I would have guessed I would have clipped. And what that means is if you get so loud, uh, eventually your mic can't take it. <laughs> and it just, it just does, you know, that. And what we'd have, uh, the reason I put that actually in the FAQ for the Team J site about don't yell is we have all these people doing stuff at full stage volume, or apparently they thought the, uh, their action verb was to yell. And, um, and it was Stonehenge 2, electric camera boogaloo. And the uh, person uh, was like, blah, 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 you know, and it was, I felt the sound wave go past me, hit the wall, and come back. And poor Barry Gribble, the camera operator, was just like, it's just, it's very mean to your, your camera operator or, or sound mixer. Uh, but the joy of doing the self-taping is now it's, now it'll be you guys. Um, and if you think about any TV or film that you've ever seen where somebody yells, uh, whether they're, you know, plunging off of Nakatomi Plaza or, or whatever it might be, um, yeah, that was a reference for Bill. Uh, they don't clip. You know, you hear perfect yelled audio. So 
you know, what, whatever you need to do, if you need to say something, uh, that's something where you just practice a couple takes so you can communicate the, hey, go there, without the sound going out. I actually, if I was looking at the recording, I'd go back and listen to that to make sure if I needed to do another take. Um, and there was a thing about bleeping profanity, um, uh, too, a question about that. Uh, I have no bleeping problem with it, uh, especially if it's, if it's like a mammoth piece, and that's the character you want to play, right? Um, if, you know, I, I would say, honestly, there are some actors who can handle uh, profanity better than others. Um, Maybe they've worked as a sailor or a uh, theater technician or something. I don't know. Uh, and, and some who don't. So if that's one of your, and there are certainly characters that swear up a storm. So if that's the type you want to sell, bleep and go for it. Now, one thing I would, I, on caveat I would put there is if you're playing a part that is written with profanity, I wouldn't censor it. In other words, if you either pick a monologue that uses it and be comfortable embracing that, or don't, or pick something else. Um, I've seen any types of things where people are trying to change a monologue to make it more friendly, and that's that's a you know a production decision as to whether we're going to edit material and stuff like this. As an actor, if you're not comfortable with this, you know don't don't try to like change it in the moment or say bleep or you know whatever in the middle of it. Pick something else. If <laughs> you're picking, if you're reading lines, and you know again in a real life audition, I've had actors come into me and say I'm not comfortable reading this dialogue. Great, mm -hmm. that's fine. I can work with you in a moment. If you're self-taping and you're sending something in, um, if it's something you're choosing, choose something you're comfortable with. That should be step one anyway. Um, yeah, full stop. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other thoughts on monologues? I know we're a bit uh, over where my uh, cunning uh, schedule was, but then we can go on submitting. All right. So yeah, let's talk about uh, submission guidelines um, and, and even just format and exporting things. So um, any of you guys, because I know all of you do a lot more exporting and sending stuff out than I do. Um, and I do mainly audio these days anyway, so. In my, in my experience, most of the stuff that your standard devices will output will work. Uh, and most stuff is going to export in an MPEG-4 format, like an MP4, M4D, uh, uh, or, or a QuickTime format, an MOV. Um, those will almost always work fairly well. The key is that those are really sort of what we call um, sort of like a, a, an enclosure. It's a, it's, a, it's a package. The format underneath it is different, whether it's H.264, or ProRes, and stuff like this. Those are all formats within the MPEG-4 wrapper, so to speak. Um, so, so that's not... Uh, okay, that was a question. WMV. I actually avoid WMV. Uh, WMV historically gives me problems. So I would try to, to see if you can convert it to something like an MPEG-4 or an MOV file and make sure you've got something that can do, uh, do those types of formats. Generally speaking, most stuff that you're using from cameras, phones, uh, these types of devices is going to be okay. Now, if for some reason you're working with a really high-end camera, a nice high-end Sony HD, you know, 4K camera, no, don't, don't try to export those types of formats. A lot of those are fairly proprietary and you need editing software to be able to actually work with those. Um, but I'm assuming most people here are not going to be in that type of situation where you're, you're up there putting that stuff together. Um, so most of those formats are okay. One of the things is, is you, you'll generally want to, you don't want your file size is huge because the, um, like an MOV file or raw ProRes, things like that, these file sizes get enormous. So most things will export as like an MPEG-4 uh, wrapper format. Um, and those are usually compressed enough that you could upload that, upload that to a site. Uh, you may not be able to stream that actually. And I, I think we all sort of talked here, I think Gordon had in some of the initial notes, do not email video, period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Never email video. Um, yeah, I think actually uh, Francis had something about, unfortunately, somebody texting video. Yeah, oh. like, you know, they'll text video or something. I mean, I don't know if anybody requests that, but like in in my job, you know, we ask people, it's like, can you send us that video or something? And they'll, maybe they'll text it. And the thing is that texting will compress it to a very, very small size so that it's, the quality is greatly compromised by the time you get it and it's pixelated and it sounds awful. So you want to avoid that. You definitely don't want to do that with your audition, sending it. And, and you have to be careful with like different methods of sending it. You know, you have to get a little tech savvy, tech savvy enough to be able to send a reasonably sized file that doesn't, um, compromise the quality of the video too much so that you're sending something that still looks and sounds good 
but is also a nice manageable file size. And that's that's easier to do now because we're dealing with, with larger file sizes than we used to. So, yeah. Um, it looks like, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say that there's there are so many different ways now. I, most auditions are gonna, probably gonna specify some kind of way for you to give them that file. They mm -hmm. might create like a Dropbox folder or something that you can upload to. And, and that is something that you have to, if you're not comfortable with, you need to figure out how to do that just for your benefit when you're submitting these things. And then there's like Google Drive and all other kinds of ways that you can upload a file to. So those are um, probably gonna be some of the options that you'll see. And, um, uh, and it could be just as easy as clicking on a link and then dragging your video file in. But you do need to export that video file in such a way that it's gonna be a manageable size and still look and sound good. Yeah, so Tara looked like you were about to say something or no? Okay, so one thing I- In fervent agreement. <laughs> okay, yeah, one thing I double checked too, I don't know, uh, and, and of course, as Bill knows, my, uh, my computer that I'm doing this on is officially, per Apple Incorporated, it's officially obsolete. Uh, so <laughs> um, and that's their designation. And uh, I believe Windows Media uh, file, that's a format from Microsoft. I don't know if Microsoft still supports that. Um, but one thing I do want, this is sort of, this is kind of the bad news thing. We're, and, and then I'll try and be frank without the Josh Lyman uh, uh, yelling, uh, that um, we're 20 years into the 21st century. Any of you, and I know I have been that at times as well. Any of you who really don't want to be a technology person, that time has come and gone. It does not matter that you are an actor. You are now an actor in the year 2020. That means you are a technology person. And if you make the choice not to be a technology person, I assure you there will be an actor. There will be dozens of actors. There will be hundreds of actors who will and the producers will cast the people who are the technology folks. So definitely, uh, we had earlier uh, somebody asking about classes, take classes, build up your network of friends who can help you with things, crowdsource knowledge however you can, but you, you just can't say, oh, I'm not a technology person. And I think that's another, that's another reason why we're doing uh, this thing tonight. It's not fun. It's not fun to know that Oh, what now? Windows Media? I, I was I was rocking Windows Media Player. It's gone. It is, you know, nothing for it. It's it's gone. So, uh, yeah, you you that's just fold that into your R and D time. Unfortunately, like resizing your headshot and figuring out file formats and other things. That unfortunately is a reality. Now, all well, that said, this does not mean you need to be an expert. Mm -hmm. um, you do not need to be an editor. You do not need to be. Does it, but there's a certain level of functionality that is going to be the minimum price of entry right now, that, that you have to be able to do this. In most cases, uh, when you're sending something for audition, for an audition, they will give you instructions. Um, and this is a point that, that I've run into as well, where if somebody says, we want you to upload your videos to this Dropbox, file, the Dropbox folder, we will send you the link, upload your videos here, make sure they are less than you know, uh, one gigabyte or whatever the, the limitation they may want to put on this, uh, usually it's lower than that, but um, but they'll, they'll, they'll tell you what the specifications are and make sure you are following the instructions. I've had any number of times where somebody goes, oh, well, I just, I couldn't figure this out, so I sent it to you this way. Mm -hmm. like, no, I'm not watching your file. You're not getting it. Um, and it's one thing if you're, you're friends and stuff like this, but keep in mind, you are not the only person who's making a special request. I can guarantee you there are five other people who have also sent in saying, oh, I know the rules can't apply to me because I have this particular constraint. And as, as, a, as a casting person, as a producer, as a director, I'm gonna go, okay, no, I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look over here and, and follow, just, I'm just looking through this folder. The, the Dropbox folder is where I assembled the videos. Those are the only ones I'm looking through. I'm not gonna spend time following a particular instructions by this one person who sent it out to, to here. There are any number of possible services, uh, uh, you know, WeTransfer, Dropbox, um, uh, uh, Box.com, uh, you know, Google Drive, all, all these systems mm -hmm. are all viable options. But first and foremost, read all the instructions very, very carefully and make sure you are following those instructions to the letter. If there's something you don't understand, ask. Um, yeah. I'm, more, I'm totally willing to help people 
uh, and, you know, I've, I've done this any number of times with, you know, with a lot of actor friends and so on. Or somebody's like, I couldn't quite understand this. Can you help me do this? I'm missing this part. Yes. In advance, yeah. of this, I will be absolutely happy to do it. But if somebody who's under pressure and under time, I don't have time to make exceptions. I don't have time to look here for your particular video and here for your particular video and here for your particular video, particularly if as a group, I'm sitting down, you know, Bjorn and I do this all the time where we're looking through like casting stuff like this. And we're like, okay, we want to go through this together. Okay, look at the, the list here, like look through here. If something's not there, we're not able to share, not able to go through that information, so. And, and that's, yeah. you know, I'll just say, that is part of the audition because you're showing your ability to follow direction when, when that happens. So if you cannot follow the directions to properly submit your, um, your audition, that is part of the audition even though it's not the performance aspect of it. It's just like, can you follow these directions that I'm giving you? Yeah, and, and I, I sometimes have, like on the, the Team J site, I, I sum up casting uh, for two things, like for, for producers and filmmakers, it's everything rolls back up to anything that you can make uh, the actor's job you know, easier or more comfortable so they can just focus on acting, that's a good thing. So like as much as possible, you don't want to have them be an editor. But the flip side of that, and unfortunately that is sort of what I was uh, touching on before, uh, for actors, anything you can do to make the casting job, a director's job easier is generally a good thing. And uh, so yeah, in most cases, uh, they will give you directions. Uh, so we've covered some of that and we can uh, even put some of these in the links. Uh, we transfer is a common one. Uh, Google Drive, uh, many of you probably have Gmail accounts, and so you have a Google Drive attached to that. Uh, many businesses use that as well. Um, Dropbox is very, very common. Uh, that's what we're gonna use for the Stonehenge stuff, and we'll, we'll go over that. Um, and you know, there's, there's a whole host of big tr file transfer uh, uh, companies out there. Uh, that can be used. And the nice thing is, I, I believe it might have been uh, either Francis or, Francis or Tara mentioned, it, it can be just as simple as drag and drop. You drag it from your desktop or your folder onto that web interface uh, and you can do that. And you can actually also Google a lot of YouTube videos uh, that show you many of these things as well. Um, yeah, so go ahead. I would say, and you know, if you're not doing a terribly long video, so it's not going to be very large. A lot of this, you may be able to do completely on your phone without ever even having to get the, the file off your phone onto your computer, if provided you are, of course, <laughs> recording with your phone. If you are, you may be able to do the whole thing on there. You can even do simple trimming just with whatever I think in, in Android, it's photo app, or I use photo app, the Google photo app. I mean, you can just like trim off the beginning and the end to make it a little cleaner and just go with that. I mean, there's not much you should have to do, hopefully, to your audition um, piece. And so you may, a lot of times, like don't just, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't let the idea that you need to be a little bit technical scare you. It's mm -hmm. not all as scary as it sounds. And a lot of times, once you figure it out, it's actually pretty simple. Yeah, the one thing I also wanna make sure that we're, we're very, very clear about is, as directors, producers, casting people, stuff, like, we want you to succeed. We want the best performances. We want the best people. We want everybody to have the best chance of putting their best foot forward, um, because ultimately that's what gets us the best, uh, the best performances, the best people for each role. So. The obstacles that are here are, then that's sort of why we're hosting this session, is to say, we want to make sure that you have the best tools at your disposal to put your best foot forward so we're able to judge your performance at, at, its, at its absolute top, at its best, so. Um, I want to share a real quick hack here. Nancy's asking um, how you can convert MPV to MP4. And um, I'm actually going to share my screen here real quick because um, earlier on when we were looking at um, Vimeo, where I have my uh, video set up there. Vimeo, you can get, it's like, it's like YouTube, but with fewer evil people. And it's like a little niche uh, video site where you can upload stuff and, and it's a much nicer community. They've actually said, hey, we're going to open ourselves up to the artists and the creators out there. So 
um, you can get a free account and you can upload free video. And the nice thing about it is, is it can handle just about any file you throw at it. And then you have the option of downloading. And it will give you a variety of resolutions. And all of these are going to be MP4. So I actually use this trick when I'm like in my job, like say I'm grabbing a video off of Twitter or something like that. And then Premiere hates it. Premiere is the software I edit in. So I use this trick. I like upload it to Vimeo and then download it um, as an HD 1080p file. And it, it, it's an MP4 file and it, it works perfectly in Premiere. So it's a free hack for everybody. So if you have like a file that you're trying to convert, you can upload it to Vimeo with a free account and then just download it um, as an MP4. And it yeah. tells you the file size. Yeah, yeah, and it's a- Yeah, yeah it's a that's very right cool there. too. Yeah, yeah and as I, as I recall, I, Maybe I missed it, Francis. Uh, the free account on Vimeo, you're limited to a certain amount of. You are you're uploads. you're limited to a certain amount of uh, how much you upload. So you do have to be cognizant of that. I have like a, they've got various tiers for the account. So I have like a pro account that's like five gigabytes per week. I think it might be it might be below one gigabyte, but even 250 megabytes for an audition, I think you're going to be fine. Because your auditions are not going to be that long, and they should not be huge files. So you should be able to upload it to Vimeo if you need to. This is if you need to. Um, and it's also a good place to like feature your reel. Because you can make that a private link. Mm -hmm. And um, OK, <laughs> I'm just reading Melissa. Yeah, I'm happy to share that hack with everybody. But um, yeah. and, and I think. You know, it's a it's a wonderful place to to host your to your reel. Like, if you want to put together an acting reel, it's a great place to host it. You're not going to have it on YouTube where people are going to just say nasty things because they can't. So, yeah. Vimeo is a much more supportive community. Uh, and you can yeah. make it private. You can have, you have all kinds of privacy settings. So you can set passwords so people need a password to look at it. You can have just a private link, which is what my video is set up as right now. So you have to have that link in order to see the video, um, and then you can set it up to download. Yeah, I swear by Vimeo. I've got not only my uh, the, uh, film stuff up, up up through Vimeo. I've got my 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 acting reel, my voiceover reel, my animation reel, editing reel, directing all my all my assorted various uh, demo reels and stuff all up through Vimeo. The other nice thing about Vimeo, as opposed to something like YouTube, is you can modify it later. So if I have an acting like say say my acting reel and I've got a new piece I want to add to it, um, I can replace the video on Vimeo, but it doesn't break any of the links. So if I'd I'd previously sent a link out to somebody as an audition, I uh, say my demo reel, and they're like, oh, hold on, I've got this new piece I wanna add to it. I can add that, throw it up there, replace the existing Vimeo file, and anybody who was looking at it before is now gonna see the most up-to-date version. It's, a, it's one of the things I love about Vimeo. Yeah. And like, replacing oh, a video okay. does not count against your quota. So I, you, I know. Keep, keep, yeah, so that's keep, like ah, very handy. That. <laughs> Bandwidth hack. Yes. Um, yeah, that's, that's something to bear in mind because uh, Vimeo and YouTube, you can embed, embed uh, the video. If you, for instance, have a uh, actor, uh, if you have a, a website for uh, for your actor self, uh, so you could just keep on updating whatever your reel is. Um, so yeah, speaking of submissions, I know we're also after eight, and we want to have time for additional questions as well. But uh, but I know a bunch of people wanted to to know was, hey, what what about the submissions for for this year's Stonehenge audition? So. Uh, Unless you guys had other things, I was going to go over that. All right, so I will share my screen. And uh, for everybody who's about to ask, what about the links? You're going to get the links in the email. So uh, it's basically a lot of what we were just saying. Uh, you want to record your monologue. Uh, can everybody see the, the four steps here? All right, so you want to record your monologue, and you've got to slate your name and the name of the piece. Uh, now, if you have attended Stonehenge in person before, you remember that we never start the timing, we never start the, uh, the timer until your, your monologue begins. Well, we kind of need to do that in this case, otherwise one of you will monologue before the monologue like some supervillain. Uh, so, um, like, like Tara was saying earlier, if you need to really explain what the piece is you're about to present, it's not a good monologue. So, you know, even saying I'm Bjorn Munson, 
hello, my name is Amigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepared to die. That doesn't take 10 seconds, you know. Uh, I'm Francis Abbey, I'm the very model of a modern major general, also does not take 10 seconds. Uh, you know, uh, I'm Bill Coughlin, I could talk about men's fashion, and uh, I forget the Alan Rickman quote, but you know, from Die Hard. You can, you can fit in the name of the piece and who wrote it or whatever in 10 seconds and go to town. Um, so one minute, 40 seconds. Uh, just like the in-person thing, there's a release. You guys are gonna get a link to that in PDF scan it, whatever, and then you want to upload that to Dropbox. Uh, for those of you who already were going to attend the uh, in-person auditions, it's the exact same file request link through Dropbox. You do not need to have any account with Dropbox to just click on the link and drag and drop your files. Uh, we don't care about your headshot and resume in this case, I'm sorry, so you know, just just the, just the video and the release, uh, just one video per person. I do that the same as, uh, I forget if I ever mentioned this, but sometimes people would send multiple headshots um, and the producers would only see, yeah, whichever the first one was. So, you know, you could send multiple videos, but we're only gonna post one. Um, and then because uh, there's no way to actually say, oh, what's the right email address? Uh, to use because remember this is a video that will be public facing and anybody on the interwebs can come and come contact you so you want to you uh, you want an email address that you're okay with people contacting you even if they're schmucks uh, and I, I feel the need to say this because it, it seems sometimes people get emailed by the schmucks which I'm really sorry about but that's what being publicly on the internet is about, unfortunately. So make sure it's a, it's a maybe not your personal email, maybe it's a, a general actor email or something like that. Uh, and if you have a uh, site, uh, you can put that in the Google form, we'll mash it up and we'll post it. Uh, one thing I noticed I didn't put in here uh, was uh, please upload it by July 31st. Because uh, we're going to have hopefully a second session of this with uh, another organization or something similar. We'll talk amongst ourselves and uh, think if this was successful or not. Um, and uh, it'll go out to all the subscribers. And I'll also post it to the uh, Women in Film and Video listserv and the uh, TIVA listserv for when it goes live. So let's see. And now I need to figure out how to unshare. <laughs> there we go. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so question about the Google form. Yeah, we'll have a link to the Google form in the email we're gonna send out uh, hopefully tomorrow, but certainly later this week. Uh, let's see. So at this point, uh, we can, uh, anybody can save one. I just wanted to quickly go through down the list. Uh, so um, Tara, where can people find you uh, online and why would people want to contact you as well? Like what's your, or what's, what's the deal with Banner Day Films? Or yeah. I can switch to one of the others if you feel up. up uh, oh no, I, I can uh, do it, I can do it. Okay, okay. hi guys. Um, so I am the owner of Banner Day Films, and we create uh, videos for nonprofits and mission-based businesses that help them change the world. That's our tagline. Um, so if, you know, that's who can contact us if you are looking for someone, um, if you're looking for someone to shoot a marketing or a, a donation soliciting video for a nonprofit or another a business that does good things. Um, that's what we specialize in. Although of course we work with other businesses as well. And uh, I will drop my website in the chat, but it's www.bannerdayfilms.com. And you can also find me um, at Banner Day Films on Facebook and Instagram and uh, LinkedIn. Thank you, uh, Francis. Yeah, I'll plug my photography, as Bjorn mentioned at the beginning. Uh, Cisco Virus Pictures is the name of my company. I'll, I'll throw in the Facebook link, because that's where 
Uh, you can see some of my work. And um, I do headshots for folks. And I like doing um, kind of cinematic portraits. Like if you're looking for stuff that looks like it's a still out of a movie, I am um, game for that stuff. And in fact, I'm looking to beef up my portfolio and I've been locked up for three months. So I'm willing to just go out and have fun if somebody's like down for some photos and they're willing to come out to my, my neck of the woods. Um, we can definitely talk so you can reach out to me. And um, uh, yeah, so I, like I said, I'll drop that in the, in the chat and you can check out some samples. And Mr. Coughlin. Uh, yeah, I wear a lot of hats. So um, the, the biggest one, of course, is Tohu Bohu Productions. Uh, that's uh, where I, which actually started out as my just independent film uh, production company, has since grown up into doing everything from uh, mostly in the post-production side. So like the editing, post-production, motion graphics and so on, although I do some occasional shooting, um, audio production work and stuff like this, some voiceover performance, uh, stuff like this as well through Tohubo Productions. That's www.tohubohu.tv. Um, and I'll go ahead and stick that in the chat as well. Um, the uh, other uh, pits are, I'm also the Associate Artistic Director of a little group called Jabberwocky Audio Theater um, that I work with a certain gentleman named Bjorn Munson. And so we do a lot of audio production work there. So that you can check that out at jabberaudio.com. I uh, do uh, some, some writing, directing, audio post-production work there, and otherwise just generally trying to support the great work of uh, other uh, uh, directors, actors, and performers in the uh, audio production world. Um, and I also uh, wear a hat as the current president of TIVA, the Television, Internet, and Video Association of DC, uh, tvdc.org, uh, another uh, wonderful uh, video trade organization in the DC area, uh, wonderful friends of women in film and video. Um, we love to, to cross-pollinate and do, do various events together, so so proud to be a part of this. Um, and uh, otherwise I do a little like individual freelance work as well, uh, do some work for PR companies and so on, but I think that's about it. All right, cool. Um, yeah, and then so uh, of course, uh, I think I mentioned before, uh, the uh, one of our casting sites for Team J has shut down, unfortunately, but we still have a Facebook presence, uh, Stonehenge Casting, you can find it there. Uh, and then our, um, our main corporate site, which is, I, I hesitate to uh, give the link to because uh, our WordPress theme died, apparently. And suddenly it's like, oh, it no longer is supported. I'm like, oh, okay. So it's, it's do a major redesign. Uh, that's goteamj.com or teamjabberwocky.com if, if you've got time on your hands to type it all out. Uh, and as Bill mentioned, jabberaudio.com. Uh, so that's, um, that's basically what we have. If people have additional questions, uh, we are happy to answer them, especially individual questions. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we will be sending out all the impossibly uh, hard to memorize links to the uh, Google form and Dropbox link for the Stonehenge videos, as well as all these other things we've talked about, uh, which is quite a bit. Uh, I'll start the general questions. Uh, how about a funny story uh, from, <laughs> from, from uh, Stonehenge? Um, well, one of my favorite, which was the cutest one, uh, was uh, when we did Stonehenge Baltimore. Uh, basically, an entire family came and auditioned. And, cause, and, and I figured that out because it's all they, they all have this last name. I'm like, okay. And what I didn't know was the ages. So this was before we switched to all video auditions and said 18 or older. And, and this was uh, to an earlier question too about what about the swearing? I'm like, well, you can, uh, or, or when people said, oh, can I have my kid audition? I'm like, yeah, but they might be with a group who does a mammoth monologue. So I call the next person, uh, their 10 year old had auditioned in an earlier slot. And I call the person, it's like Daniel, whatever the last name is. And I look up at the stage and they're not there. And I'm like, uh, Daniel so-and-so. And then I feel something on my, my, my knee. And it's this little four-year-old boy <laughs> that wandered up to me. <laughs> the mom had signed up her four-year-old. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, okay. Um, and I guided him up there and I'm, he sort of gave him some direction. And, Honestly, I don't think he really said much anything at all, and, and we just uh, called it. But that was that was very cute. Well, maybe he was going to do mammoth. It it could be, you know, boss baby all the way. 
Yeah, I was just saying, I think, I think my daughter Anna, when she was 16, I think she auditioned at that Baltimore, that same Baltimore session. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That might be the one where the person set off the sparklers, too. Um, <laughs> so I see, I see a question from Gail. Oh. That was actually for me. Uh-oh. Um, uh, she said uh, she wanted me to go over again facing the camera. And I think she said I was in profile. I think what you were talking about, Gail, is I was talking about um, when you are off to a side, if you're doing it as at the third, as we call it, one third, one third, your eyes there. Um, if, uh, if you're doing that, you don't really want to face this way normally because that doesn't give you as much, uh, as much nose room. Uh, you want to face this way. So that's what I was kind of talking about. You want to give yourself the space in front of you rather than behind you. Because if it's behind you, it looks awkward and we kind of worry about you. <laughs> if you put it in front of you, it looks open. Yeah, it's, it's generally considered sort of, if you're, you're, you're here facing off screen, it's like implying that you're, you're hiding something, you're keeping secrets, you're doing something yeah. dark. And again, Yes, that might be appropriate for the monologue you're choosing, but again, it would be distracting to the point where people would be wondering why you're doing that. If you want to see a lot of that, watch the King's speech. Mm. They did a lot of like shallow nose room to like make you feel like nervous and anxious like he is. It's, um, it's really well used. So it's something that, as I was saying, you got to know the rules to break the rules. <laughs> so. It's a rule you can break, but you better know really sure, really surely why you're doing it. There was one other point that I, I think I wanted to make, I didn't quite make it clear, so is you generally, for something like this, you want to avoid a lot of uh, special editing techniques. We talked before about not doing fancy backgrounds or green screens or anything like this, um, but particularly when you're using a monologue, you generally want it to be a monologue, not a dialogue, where I'm trying to play multiple parts or do editing. Yeah, I've seen those before where somebody's trying to edit, play both parts, um, like cut back and forth. And the problem with that, with that is then I'm not getting a sense of what your actual timing is. Are you just a good editor? Are you like doing stuff after the fact? Uh, and you're, you're not really reacting to somebody. Um, sometimes when you're doing a particular, reading particular sides, that can be tough if you don't have somebody to read against. But ideally, don't do anything like, like fancy, funny editing techniques, stuff like anything that's going to distract from my ability to evaluate your performance. Just the conversation about thirds and directions reminded me of that as well. Yeah, and I'd mentioned too, you know, shorter is always fine. Leave, leave, uh, leave people wanting more. Like there's no reason you need to try and max out uh, the one minute, 40 seconds uh, for those of you planning to self tape and upload. Anybody got any more questions? All right. Oh, we got one more here. Yeah. Oh, just my mic. I asked about my mic today is my, my onboard mic. I normally have an Audio Technica mic that I use for my audio stuff, um, but it's in the other room where I actually record most of my audio work. And so I didn't want to disassemble the whole thing and bring it all out here. So this is, this is I, I'm using the existing Apple laptop and MacBook Pro microphone speakers today. So I'm going cheap. <laughs> well, not cheap, but yeah. basic. We have a question about uh, looking which way to look, uh, which side of your sermon to directing your monologue to your uh, on-screen person. I, I think it's it's a, it's a choice. You can either it, it's uh, if you're doing dramatic work. And again, please, other panels, feel free to jump in here as well. Um, you can do, and we've seen this at the Stonehenge editions, where sometimes people direct their entire monologue to the camera directly. And that, that can be fine if I'm really trying to generate emotional connection. If, I'm try, if the implication is that I'm reacting to another person or, or react to something, then it might be better to do something where I'm, I'm actually acting off camera here, do, doing this way. Um, the key is I don't want the audience to feel uncomfortable. If my directing this real intensity to the camera is going to make them feel awkward or uncomfortable, that's not in keeping with a character that I want to portray, that can be a little bit. But I, honestly, as a, as a director, I can go either way. I, I'm happy with either one. So I think I see this question and she's, uh, she's asking, can you clarify whether to look directly at the end lens or look a bit to the side of it? Um, I think we've all, well, a lot of us have heard that as actors, like don't look right into the lens, look just to the side of it. Um, yeah. I think if you're, if you are, 
and when I was first talking about looking lens, we, it was right coming off Bill talking about the announcer thing where normally you would be talking to camera. So if you're doing an announcer thing, you're talking to camera, talk, just talk to camera, I would say. Um, and then if you're, if you're doing like a break the fourth wall or, you know, where you're talking to the camera, I, for me, I find it's a little distracting if you're looking just a little bit off. And I think on the, on the, small phones it's a little more exaggerated i feel like because of where you have to like place them so for me i say just look into the lens if that's what your intention is mm -hmm. but i don't know if everyone else will agree with me on that <laughs> i yeah i think there's especially with the self-taped uh or even the in-person stonehenge i think there's more leeway because people know it's just there as an acting sample but i will also say if you think about every TV show and movie you've seen that isn't nonfiction, that isn't a newscast, most people aren't Deadpool or Ferris Bueller. Most people are not looking directly at camera. Uh, and there can be a lot of fun uh, as you're creating, you're, you're portraying this character, there can be a lot of fun if you're looking just off camera and you're doing your monologue and the producer is figuring out who is at the other side of this conversation. How much can I learn how that person is reacting based on their doing it? Because I'm only seeing the one edit. That can be like, that can be a lot of fun to see because you're not watching TV shows where people are just looking right at camera and cutting back to somebody else's camera. You know, except for newscasts, trick shots, and Deadpool. But for the newscast, I would say just look into the camera. Like, why look just a few inches off? Just look mm -hmm. at the camera. Or don't look at the camera. I guess what I'm saying is make the choice. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then there's a, can you talk about having a reading partner? Uh, so that's uh, one thing. If you're doing a self-taped audition, let's say they've given you dialogue to read. Uh, it's perfectly fine to have somebody, unless they say otherwise in the instructions, it's perfectly fine to have somebody just reading the lines and feeding it to you. They should probably then be sitting where you can have to the eye line. And they probably should not be uh, calling too much attention to themselves, just giving a nice flat read so you can play off of it. And again, that conceit will play. Um, I don't know if, uh, Tara, Francis, you had other, uh, Bill had other thoughts about that. My thought is just basically, you know, we're not, we're not evaluating that reader's performance. So mm -hmm. as Bjorn said, we want that to be reasonable, flat, enough that you can react to it, but not something that's going to distract from your performance is what we're focusing on. Now I've had, uh, and, and Bjorn can attest this, we sat in auditions where I've had people who are really good actors being sitting there, and we have people who are so bad at it that it's actually distracting from the performance. Um, you generally don't want that. You want somebody who can basically just deliver the lines, read them, not try to read too much into it, not try to do anything dramatic to it so it's not uh, taking away from our ability to evaluate your performance. Yeah, so they're I, there to make I, you look good. <laughs> yeah. I haven't really encountered this, so I'm, I'm curious what you guys think. What about if you don't have a scene partner and, it, and it's, just, it's a back and forth scene? What do you uh, I, I've actually uh, I've actually seen that uh, a couple times at the Stonehenge auditions too, and it's it's uh, um, in in both cases the the actor was really good, and they filled the moment with the reaction, and that was really nice to see. Um, I would suspect uh, this is where I I'd want more than the four of us. I'd probably want four hundred people for a good sample size. I, but my suspicion is a lot of uh, filmmakers might be a bit thrown by that uh, if it was self-taped. So I, I'm not sure. I, I would happy, I, I want more data. Uh, so I don't have a conclusive answer. Yeah, my, my only point was earlier with the editing, like it, it's the, the funky editing techniques and trying, trying to play both parts. That, that for me is, is distracting. Um, but again, a lot of it, like, you know, I'm in the, we're in the, the journal know this, we're in the process of casting a piece right now. Um, where we've developed sides, but a lot of the sides are such, they're not monologues. This is not a monologue driven piece. So they all require some kind of an acting partner or somebody to act against. Um, so that, well, that's a challenge in the era of self-taping. 
uh, that we don't mm -hmm. want to, in the, the live audition session, one of us can sort of do the, the, do the read and we, we'd be opposite parts. Well, that might not be the case with something like this. So it's very helpful to have an acting, somebody to read those opposite lines with you. Um, I think somebody in the chat, uh, uh, where was it? Um, Oh, Gene, Rosalina just sort of said, yeah, call uh, Skype a friend and have them do it and do it virtually. You can, but then of course you're also dealing with an extra bit of technology that might be problematic. So, so it can, it can be challenging, but, but yes, that's, a, I think that's a great suggestion. Mm -hmm. uh, Nancy's got a question in the chat and um, she's asking, I think basically just had a, so she's trying to combine her, um, her intro, the slate and everything, I think with her monologue. So I think the question is like how to do that. And I think that she said that she's using a Windows computer and I think that's why she had an earlier question about, I think it was about WMV earlier. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, I mean like the Vimeo hack would work for that. So if you if you use Windows, like the, like Windows Movie Maker or whatever program comes with Windows now, I don't know what it is, but you can combine those two pieces export it as a WMV, throw it on Vimeo, and then you can download a, a, an MP4. And that would be one way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you but can't, it, I don't think you can combine clips within Vimeo. I don't think yeah, you can take I, the two I, I don't think you can do that, yeah. Yeah, so um, that would be one solution. And there are, I think like, you know, if, you're, if you need editing capability, there are options out there. Um, I was just Googling really quick, like online editors, and there are like, sites where you can like upload some footage. I mean, they're not like heavy duty, but I mean, for what, for what you're trying to accomplish here, if it's like a 30 second or a 60 second piece, you can upload those two videos, put them together and export a single file. Uh, so I think that, you know, there's, there are resources available. And then like just a quick Google, we'll, we'll turn those things up. Just look for like online editor, video editor, online video editor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that also relates to a question that I think uh, Michael Gable had earlier in the chat, didn't get a chance to address about how uh, some recommendations are, you know, start with your face, then pull out for six seconds. Um, how could you do that with a phone? And, and the, re the real, the short answer is you have somebody else do it with you. Um, mm -hmm. Certain types of things you can't just do yourself. I'd like any type of this here, you need to set it up yourself and do it for, now you could theoretically walk up to the camera and then, you know, step back out, but then you're, you're messing with focus and, and exposure and stuff like this as well. So a lot of those things, sometimes they, you are, sometimes you do need help to have somebody else I give you a hand with that. I'm helpful that I have my uh, my my family and stuff here at uh, quarantined here with me to sort of help with those things. But uh, but yeah, I that think can be a little bit difficult. Unless those are like they're they're very specifically asking for like a six second zoom out, and that sounds like something that's like more tailored to like old style cameras with like the rocker zoom mm -hmm. in zoom out. I think like what they're trying to accomplish is they want to see you close and they want to see you wide. So you could accomplish the same thing just by doing like you have a shot of your face, introduce yourself, and then have a, a full body shot. So, um, so you're accomplishing basically the same thing, and that's one way you can do it by yourself. It's like you know, just do the, the close-up shot, zoom it out, and then have that wide shot, and then you can put them together um, in editing. Alrighty, well, I think we've answered all the questions, and uh, looks like we've got rave reviews in the uh, chat. Oh, we got another one coming in here. Oh, very helpful. Another positive review has come in. So uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for this great presentation and remind everybody that we're uh, going to be doing this again in two weeks. So uh, come back if, uh, if you'd like. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thanks to everybody for attending. I really do hope this was, uh, was helpful for you. Nice pandemic break. <laughs> Hopefully we will all uh, be back at it soon. I hope so. Hope so.